Welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the presentations, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, please press star 1. Today's conference is being recorded, and if you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the meeting over to Trent Parado. Sir, you may begin. Thank you, Lori. Uh, I'm Trent Parado, Public Affairs Officer at NASA Headquarters in Washington. I'd like to welcome you to today's media telecon to discuss new findings from the Mars Science Laboratory Radiation Assessment Detector aboard the rover Curiosity. We have four speakers joining us today. Each will give brief remarks, and then we'll open the phone lines for questions and answers. You can find graphics related to today's presentations at go.nasa.gov slash curiosity telecon. Today's speakers are Chris Moore, Deputy Director of Advanced Exploration Systems here at NASA Headquarters in Washington. Next, Donald Hasler, he's a RAD Principal Investigator and Program Director at the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio. Next, Carrie Zeitlin, a Principal Scientist also at Southwest Research Institute. And Eddie Simonis, Spaceflight Radiation Health Officer at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. With that, I'll hand over the discussion to Chris Moore. Good afternoon. Uh, NASA is planning to send astronauts to Mars around the middle of the 2030s. And before we can send astronauts there, we need to understand the environments and hazards that they would face. So NASA's uh, Human Exploration Program and Planetary Science Programs have been working together to gather critical data and the radiation assessment detector on the Curiosity rover is a great example of this collaboration. The RAD data will help us to design uh, deep space habitats in which the astronauts would live on the trip to Mars. And it will help us to improve radiation shielding to protect them from the harmful effects of space radiation. And I'll summarize some of the current technology development in radiation protection a little later, but first I'd like to introduce uh, Don Hassler, the RAD Principal Investigator from the Southwest Research Institute. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I'd like to just uh, say briefly a little description of RAD. RAD is one of the ten instruments on the Mars Science Laboratory. Um, it's not one of the smallest, but it's not the largest either. Uh, the first image is, is a picture of RAD being held by one of our uh, engineers in the lab. It's about the size of a coffee maker or a, or a blender. And uh, the primary objective of RAD was to characterize the radiation environment on the surface of Mars. But we realized about a year and a half before launch that uh, you know, RAD on the rover sitting inside the spacecraft on its way to Mars was also uh, something uh, of a unique perspective. And so if you look at the next graphic, it sort of shows a cartoon, well, it's a CAD drawing, actually, of, uh, of MSL spacecraft. Uh, next to the the crew exploration vehicle Orion, and you can see that they're they're not so different in their in their shape and their well their sizes are different, but their but their shape and their structures are are not so different. And so we realized that uh, taking measurements uh, during the cruise phase on the way to Mars in deep space would be not so different than uh, acting as a proxy for the radiation environment that a uh, that a future human astronaut might experience in their spacecraft on their way to Mars. So we um, we worked with the project to enable us to uh, to take these observations, and we turned RAD on about 10 days after the launch of uh, of Curiosity, and we took about seven months of data. And uh, the types of radiation that are important that RAD measures, there's really two types, at least in deep space primarily. Uh, there's galactic cosmic rays, which come from outside the solar system, thought to be coming from uh, supernova remnants, and other sources, they're very high energy, and uh, but moderately low level, and they vary slowly over the course of the 11-year solar cycle. And then there's the radiation which comes from the sun in the form of solar energetic particles, and these are the, these are associated with these solar storms or or coronal mass ejections or flares, and they happen. They're very difficult to predict, and they happen uh, quickly, and they can last on the order of of uh, hours to days, and they can be very intense. Um, but uh, only last for for a few days. So characterizing these two types of radiation is uh, was was our primary objective of 
of uh, these measurements during cruise. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to Kerry Zeitlin, who's the, the RAD instrument scientist and the first author on the, the science paper. Uh, thank you very much, Don. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking our colleagues at, at uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. Um, they, they made great efforts to uh, support us uh, during the, the cruise. Uh, it was a lot of uh, extra work for people there uh, at a time when they were extremely busy uh, getting ready for Curiosity's surface mission. Um, so the RAD team would like to extend our, our thanks to the, the folks at JPL who, who helped us out so much to make this measurement. Um, okay, so I, I'd like to uh, go through a few slides uh, describing how we did the measurement and then uh, trying to give a little uh, context for our results. Uh, so if you look at uh, the first uh, graph um, with my name on it, it uh, shows the dose rate that we measured with a particle detector uh, that, as Don described, was uh, inside the MSL spacecraft. And um, what you see in the figure is uh, it's sort of mostly a flat line. That's the dose rate from the galactic cosmic rays. Um, on top of that flat line, there are five periods where we saw higher dose rates from solar particle events. And even though RAD was, was deep inside the spacecraft, some of the solar particles got through. Uh, one, one thing to note in this graphic is that the detector that we used to make the measurement is made of silicon. And for human exploration, we're interested in the dose rate in tissue. So that's a little different and we have to uh, convert the silicon dose to the tissue dose, and that's done by uh, multiplying in a, a just by a scale factor uh, as a sort of a first-order correction. Um, okay, if you look at the second graph now, um, you see th this is uh, sort of where we go in the uh, analysis of the data. Um, we have to obtain what's called the LET spectrum. LET stands for linear energy transfer. And that's the amount of energy a particle uh, deposits per unit distance traveled in water. Uh, once we have that spectrum, which is what you see um, the data points there, uh, we multiply it by a function that's called the quality factor. And the quality factor tries to account for the different biological effectiveness of different particle types. Uh, and the quality factor is something that NASA is actually working to uh, better understand. Uh, particularly in, uh, in the context of space radiation and, and high energy cosmic rays. Uh, for, for the study that uh, we did here, we used the quality factor uh, specified by the uh, International Commission on Radiation Protection. And that, that quality factor function is, is shown in this graph as a, a green line that's uh, scaled down to, to fit on the plot. But what you can see is that um, over much of the range, uh, it's, it's a flat line with a value of 1, and then as you get out towards these higher values of LET, that begins to rise and it reaches a peak, uh, and that reflects the um, more damaging qualities of uh, what we call high LET radiation, which is basically uh, heavy ions in the galactic cosmic rays in this context. Um, so what we get out of this step of analysis is multiplying the spectrum by the weighting factor uh, is the average quality factor. That multiplies the dose, and it gives us a quantity called dose equivalent. And dose equivalent is what we use to relate the radiation exposure to the risk of cancer induction. So uh, we the found that uh, during the cruise that um, the galactic cosmic rays were averaging 1.8 millisieverts per day uh, throughout. Uh, and that actually is a value that's very much in line with earlier measurements from Apollo and Skylab, and, uh, and there have also been a number of model calculations, and uh, we, we fit pretty well with the model calculations. Uh, so moving on to my uh, third and final graph, trying to put that, that number, that dose equivalent number, into some context. Um, starting from the left, um, the radiation exposure that we all get on the surface of the Earth when people look at per year from cosmic rays that uh, reach the surface of the Earth is a fraction of a millisievert per year. Um, and if you consider all the sources of radiation that we encounter in our routine lives on Earth, uh, at least in the U.S., you average a few millisieverts per year. So um, uh, somewhat more, actually, from other sources than from from cosmic radiation on Earth, uh, it's basically medical in the U.S. Um, if you go and get an abdominal CT scan, you get a little bit less than 10 millisieverts from that. Uh, if you're a radiation worker in the U.S., you're allowed to get up to 50 millisieverts per year. Uh, if you're an astronaut and you go to the International Space Station, you, you uh, get about 100 millisieverts in six months. And 
Nelly Siebert. Um, and that's, that's just the galactic cosmic ray part of it. If uh, there were large uh, solar events that could add significantly to that total. Um, on, on our particular trip, uh, there was only about a 5% contribution from, from the solar events, but that could be higher uh, under different circumstances. Um, so just to, to kind of sum up, uh, the radiation environment in, in deep space is uh, several hundred times more intense than it is on Earth, uh, and that's even inside uh, a shielded spacecraft, uh, such as uh, inside MSL, where we made our measurements. So um, let me uh, turn it over to Eddie Simonis from NASA Johnson. Thanks, Gary. I'd um, just like to say NASA is very excited uh, to get this new cruise data to help us to uh, refine and improve our radiation environment models that we use to estimate crew exposure and risks for various mission scenarios. Um, this uh, cruise data is critical uh, in the understanding of the impacts of galactic cosmic rays and solar particle events inside a platform similar to the vehicles that we're developing for human exploration missions currently. Um, I want to highlight that this data is also useful uh, not just for a, a Mars-specific mission, but any mission that has a, uh, a sizable free space component or, or a component that's beyond low Earth orbit like the ISS. Those could be asteroid capture missions or cislunar missions such as the first manned missions of the MPCV uh, outward to the moon, for example, on EM2. The initial comparisons uh, that are highlighted in the paper so there's favorable agreement between the NASA models and the RAD measured data, specifically comparing the, the summary dose and dose equivalent rate quantities. We use those quantities and those values to estimate crew risks. Um, this data is going to be utilized uh, with our NASA models to estimate those crew risks, but it also can be used to inform standard and exposure limit setting bodies uh, that are out trying to develop uh, NASA standards for exploration missions currently. And I would like to highlight the fact that there's a currently a public meeting uh, on this very topic today in D.C. at the National Academy of Sciences building. Um, the Committee on Aerospace Medicine and the Medicine of Extreme Environments are currently looking at exploration uh, standards for NASA and, and our way forward uh, for long-duration exploration missions. Um, in 2015, we'll be launching a modified version of RAD to the ISS, and we're real excited about that. This will be the first time we measure the radiation environment in LEO and on the Mars surface simultaneous with basically the same instrument. This will allow us to uh, compare actual crew exposures and calcul calculated risks in an ongoing mission, as well as a future destination directly in real time. And uh, with that, I'll pass it on to Chris. Okay, thanks, Eddie. I'd like to give you all an overview of current work in radiation protection technology. And there are basically uh, two ways we can protect the astronauts against harmful radiation. Uh, the first is in the layout of the deep space habitat. We know that hydrogen is a very effective uh, shielding material. It attenuates the energy of radiation particles. So one way we can protect the crew is to surround them with water in the walls of the habitat, which would absorb the space radiation. Um, we also could arrange uh, food packages around the quarters where the astronauts uh, sleep and live, because food contains a lot of water and, and hydrogen. And currently, we use uh, radiation shielding, which is the second method of protection. Um, on the ISS, we use polyethylene, which is a long-chain hydrocarbon. There's lots of hydrogen attached to the carbon backbone that attenuates the radiation. So we're trying to improve the effectiveness of our radiation shielding. Uh, we have the NASA Space Radiation Laboratory at Brookhaven National Lab in New York, and at that facility, it's a particle accelerator. It generates high-energy beams of ions that we uh, project against radiation shielding and try to measure their effectiveness. Uh, we're also developing deployable storm shelters, so in the case of a solar particle event, the astronauts could deploy this enclosure around their body uh, to give them additional protection 
and we're planning to test uh, some of those on Orion in the next few years. Uh, we're working to validate radiation transport models. These are mathematical models that predict how radiation uh, penetrate, penetrates uh, spacecraft structures. When a cosmic ray particle hits the spacecraft structure, it generates a spray of secondary particles, such as neutrons, and those can be uh, more harmful than the uh, initial uh, cosmic ray itself. So we have to understand how radiation interacts with the spacecraft structure and the rad data give us some good initial indications of how that occurs. And we're trying to use that to validate and improve our, our, our models. Uh, finally, we're working on solar uh, particle event forecasting models, uh, looking at signs on the sun of impending uh, solar particle events, uh, you know, using sunspots and solar flares and other indicators to try to give us a few days of advance uh, warning. Right now we only get about an hour or two of warning before uh, solar particle events hit the Earth, but with forecast models we hope to do uh, longer range uh, prediction just like we predict the weather here on Earth. So that's a uh, broad overview of our activities in, in radiation protection. Great. Thanks, Chris. Okay, now we'll move on to the question and answer session. Uh, as a reminder, you can signal the operator that you have a question by pushing the star 1 keys on your telephone. When possible, please direct your question to a specific speaker, since we have uh, those joining virtually uh, around the world, so it'll help eliminate some confusion. Uh, and with that, we'll hand it over to the uh, operator to take the first question. Thank you. And at this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. Please unmute your phone and record your first and last name when prompted. And to withdraw the question, you may press star 2. Once again, please press star 1 if you'd like to ask a question. And there will be just one moment, please, for our first question. And our first question is from Kenneth Chang. Hi. Thanks for taking the question. Um, what is the risk of cancer deaths or uh, for one sievert, and what's the acceptable risk? Eddie, why don't you take that? Yeah, uh, let me take this. This is Eddie Simonis at Johnson. So um, in our press release, we've indicated for, for nominal um, Earth-based exposures, the ICRP um, publication will indicate about a 5% excess fatal cancer risk for one sievert exposures. Um, NASA standard, our NASA standard um, uh, limits the crew risk of uh, fatal cancer to 3% at a 95% confidence interval or, or level. Thanks. Our next question comes from Mark Carew. Um, also, thank you very much, um, and I'm asking for Aviation Week. Um, the, the article mentions acceleration uh, or faster propulsion. Um, however, it's hard to gauge uh, whether that's possible with, with chemical rockets. Uh, could you discuss uh, the best, you know, to the best of your ability what sorts of propulsion technologies would really make a significant difference? What, you know, how many days are you talking about for transits to really... Um, significantly lower the risk. So this is Chris Moore. There's two basic types of advanced propulsion we're developing, uh, solar electric propulsion systems and nuclear thermal rockets. Um, the solar electric propulsion systems are more mature and uh, they generate um, very low thrust but over a long period of time and they could be used uh, to transport both uh, crew and cargo to Mars. Um, but to get uh, really fast trip times and cut down on the radiation exposure, we would probably need nuclear thermal propulsion. And uh, we're working with the U.S. Department of Energy now to look at um, various types of fuel elements uh, for these rockets, but it's a long-range um, technology development activity, and it will probably 
be uh, many years before that is ready. But it is part of our uh, design reference um, mission architecture for sending humans to Mars is the use of nuclear rockets. And that could probably cut the trip time down to around 180 days, I believe. That would be round trip, 180 days round trip, or about uh, half? Uh, the... About one way. Uh, could you talk about, like, superconducting magnets? Um, I know that's rather exotic, but I've heard talk that that's a possible shielding strategy. Is that out of reach, under consideration? And that's my last question. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very uh, immature technology at present. We're doing some initial studies on that. But the idea is to have powerful magnetic fields that would deflect charged particles. Uh, from the sun or from cosmic rays. Uh, the trouble is we don't really understand the effects of high magnetic fields on the human body. And, you know, we would need uh, very large uh, magnets, and we are looking at superconductors as a possible way to uh, you know, reduce the magnet size. But it would require a lot of power for the electromagnets, and uh, but it does have promise. So we're doing some really uh, advanced studies on that now. Our next question is from Bill Harwood. Thank you. Bill Harwood, CBS News. Um, I'm just trying to get a sense, um, looking at that final graph that shows the relative um, exposure um, Levels. Can you can you can someone talk a little bit about what is required for shielding alone if we want to make a trip to Mars safe? I mean, is that doable, or do you have to have shielding and faster transportation? I'm really trying to just get a better context for just how dangerous is this. This is Eddie Simone at Johnson. I can answer that. Um, Shielding is required, uh, number one, for the solar particle events. As you as they indicated, they saw five during that mission. The, the shields that we're developing or the deployable shields are very effective at uh, reducing or even eliminating the effects from the solar particle events because they're low energies um, and it can reduce those impacts. For the galactic cosmic rays, generally the thicknesses required to have any substantial reduction um, exceed uh, uh, spacecraft that we can effectively launch. The shields are very, very thick, meters thick, to, to make an effect. So really the shields uh, are very important uh, for eliminating the solar particle events, but we're not going to be able to you know, solve it with passive shielding for the galactic cosmic rays. So you need both, as you said, as you, as you kind of alluded to. We need to get there faster to reduce the impact of the galactic cosmic rays, but we need to have shielding, local shielding on board to eliminate the effects of solar particles. And so it's hand in hand. Well, just to follow up on that very briefly, and this is my last question, if you're, you know, if we take as a notional mission something in the 2030s or whatever, um, you're saying we need these things for that very first mission. I mean, this is not some place you want to go without these strategies already in place. Am I reading that right? Uh, that's correct. And, you know, we're currently developing uh, shielding approaches for the solar particle events, and that, that's technology that's readily available. We just have to um, fit within the, the spacecraft and the, and the mission scenarios that we're talking about and effectively use those shields. Um, but as far as propulsion and getting there faster, as Chris said, we're, we're, we're years away from that. But uh, we have a path forward. We're working on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jonathan Amos. Hi. Thanks very much. I wonder if I could just uh, tease those uh, um, uh, numbers uh, apart uh, again, if I can. When, when we say a, a 3% increase, I mean, I have a, um, you know, I've got a sort of one in four chance here in the U.K. of, of developing a, a fatal cancer in my lifetime just sitting here on Earth. Um, so that that three percent um, is that three uh, percent absolute uh, uh, addition, or is that three percent of the uh, of the twenty five percent? Yeah, that's an excess to the your, the background rates. Yeah, and the you know, nominal twenty to twenty five percent, as you said, you're in the UK. This yeah. would be an addition to your your background. Of course, the astronaut population is a, is a healthy population. 
we factor in that, that their healthy lifestyle uh, in their lifespan and in our risk calculations. But uh, in general, it is uh, this when we speak of a of excess fatal cancer risk, it is above the baseline. Of right. So it's three percent of twenty five. That's correct. Yeah. No, it's, it's, sorry, it's three percent on top of twenty five percent. Yeah, right. Okay. Twenty eight. Thought that's what yeah. saying. Uh, absolutely. So it's additional and absolute. It's, yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. We call okay. it excess risk of exposure induced death is the actual terminology we use. Read, and it's got a, a strict formalism that accounts properly and it, and it gives you an excess fatal cancer on top of the baseline. Right. Okay. And, and given, so, given what you know now, I mean, today. Um, would, would NASA authorize a mission to Mars, given what it knows? I mean, obviously the technology is not quite in place to do it anyway, but on, with, with you know, what, what we see today, what we understand today with what we, what we have in the kit bag today, um, so you'd struggle to, to authorize a mission today, wouldn't you? Well, if you, if you extrapolate the, the daily uh, measurements that were made uh, by RAD or mo- and the models, um, if you were to extrapolate to a, a, a mission such as a 500-day Mars mission or the DRMs that are uh, that are that are available, you you would incur exposures that would cause most individuals to exceed that three percent um, limit. So um, currently, um, as I said in, in my brief statement, that we're looking at that standard, that three percent standard, and its applicability for exploration type missions, and that those uh, discussions are going forward um, now on how to how to handle that. And what steps need to be made to, to protect a crew going forward? So, so you might actually have to, to raise the limit or, or find other some some other mitigating factors to to reduce the risk. That's correct. Okay. Our next question comes from Mike Wall. Uh, okay. Hi guys. Thanks again for for doing this. Um, yeah. So I just had a question. You guys said that. That like these results are, I mean, basically in line with the models and uh, the Apollo results. So, so could you just talk a little bit? I mean, are these going to change anything about how you are planning for a Mars mission or a deep space mission, or or is this something that that's really not a game changer because it's it's already in line with sort of what you already knew? Who who is that question for, Mike? Oh, um, well, maybe Chris. I mean, Chris, could you address that? Well, I think that probably Eddie would be um, better because I'm not familiar with the radiation data acquired by Apollo and Skylab. Sure, sure. I mean, whoever could could feel comfortable addressing. I mean, yeah. I, mean, I just want to get an idea of. I mean, are these results kind of changing how you guys are going to plan a mission going forward, or is this something that you already knew? I would say these these aren't uh, these are confirmatory measurements, and it will help us refine our models. And you know, when we're talking about crew health, we want to be as accurate as possible. So even making improvements, uh, ten to twenty percent improvements on, say, the space environment data or the calculation of the effect of the solar particle event still will be important. This isn't factor of two that is going to all of a sudden change our paradigm. Um, we'll be able to use the data collected and run it through our models to, to, to ensure we can most accurately predict what the crew is going to see. And that's really what we're using this crew's data for. Now, uh, of course, they're on the surface now and that data is forthcoming, but we're going to continue to look at the the effect of the uh, Martian atmosphere and the solar cycle on uh, solar particle events that are, are seen at the uh, Mars surface. And we'll start learning what kind of habitats may be needed on the Mars surface, for example, uh, to shield against solar particle events and look at long-term exposures for some uh, for missions that uh, have the crew on the, the planetary surface for an extended period of time. So that stuff is all um, going to really improve and, and drive our understanding of, of the environment on the surface of Mars, and that's forthcoming. Hopefully that answered your question. Okay, okay, great. And, yeah, I, mean, I just wanted to, to just sort of reinforce what other people have been asking, too. I mean, if there is no alternative propulsion methodology that's developed by the mid-2030s or so and there is no way to get there faster, I mean, would you guys still consider launching a mission? I mean, you guys talked a little bit earlier about maybe you have to raise that 3% limit. I mean, is the need for for advanced propulsion so 
like so great and and now I mean demonstrably great after a study like this that that you might put a little more resources toward uh, toward developing that faster if we're really going to pull off a, a Mars mission by the mid 2030s. Th those kinds of questions are actually being addressed by the Institute of Medicine now. The, you know, the, the idea is, is this a national imperative, and how how you ethically um, exceed current uh, acceptable standards. Yeah, so that's work going forward at a much higher level than uh, than say this, the science objectives of this particular mission. But but certainly um, uh, our knowledge of the radiation effects is going to improve through our research going forward into the 2030s. So you know, there's a lot of time for us to have technological and uh, biological um, uh, knowledge that's going to help improve the problem as we uh, evolve. But you know, it, the snapshot today is we would exceed our limits. But you know, we're looking at the the, the relevant you know, issues. Uh, if you were going to, if nothing else changed, et cetera, right now with the Institutes of Medicine, I, I encourage you to to look at what their uh, their task and what they're looking at going forward, if that's of, of interest to you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mark Kaufman. Uh, yes, hi, thanks. Um, as some of my questions were already uh, asked and answered, but if you could first just tell me who was the last person speaking, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, and then also, I, I just want to get a sense of, was there anything or is there anything in the data that came as a surprise? You said that it is largely confirmatory, but are there, are, are there any aspects of it that were different than expected? Um, and if so, what were they? And uh, what might what implications might they have? Mark, did you mean last person speaking in the presentations? No, uh, no just the last person person speaking, uh, giving answers about um, uh, answers to questions. Eddie, that was, Eddie. That, was Eddie. That, was, that was Eddie Simonis, right, Eddie? That's correct. I was the last one speaking. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, this is Gary. Uh, I would. Uh, I wouldn't mind taking a, a, a crack at Mark's question. Um, uh, as far as what was surprising in, in the measurement, uh, it, it's, it's quite true, as, uh, as Eddie has pointed out, that uh, our results are in line with, with models. Um, of course, the models uh, that, that were uh, model calculations that had been made years in advance um, have to make some assumptions about what sort of shielding you're going to be under and also have to make uh, some educated guesses about the state of the solar cycle because the solar modulation actually affects the level of galactic cosmic rays uh, coming into the heliosphere. And if you look back at the solar cycle predictions from, uh, say, about 2008, 2009, what people were expecting for this uh, period uh, of cruise, in 2009, looking ahead to 2011, 2012, they were predicting a sort of a normal solar maximum. Uh, and in fact, what we're having is a very weak solar maximum. And the weak solar maximum means that more galactic cosmic rays are getting in. So if you had predicted in 2009 what was going to happen in, in early 2012, you, you would have expected actually a, a lower uh, rate of, uh, of, of galactic cosmic rays and therefore a lower dose rate overall. So the, the surprise uh, there is, is simply the weakness of, of the solar maximum that we're having now. And uh, um, that, at least in my mind, that, that raises the, the question, how well can we really predict the solar cycles? And, and that's, a, that's kind of a separate area of research, uh, but, but also one that's very important uh, in, in this question. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from Irene Klotz. Thank you. Um, I have two questions related to um, radiation dosages, so it's probably for Eddie. Uh, the first is the, the career limit of one sievert. Is that um, different amounts or types of radiation uh, depending on whether you're talking about a 30-year-old woman or a 60-year-old man? Uh, let me clarify. So we don't have... NASA does not have a one sievert limit. Our limit uh, in, our, in our press release is a is a three percent fatal cancer limit at a ninety five percent confidence level, and so we apply the identical risk limit to all crew members. So it's not a uh, you, uh, it's not a direct dose limit per se. 
each person has a different, uh, you know, say background exposure. They worked and, and had a already had a radiation exposure profile, for example, and it's an age dependent uh, risk factor. So uh, it's individualized, but uh, it's all uh, ensuring that the crew has uh, the same amount of allowable risk at three percent at the ninety five percent confidence level. Okay, so the, where does the one sievert figure come from that's been, I guess, bandied about for a while? And then the other question I had was um, somewhat related. If you know if uh, Russia and, I guess, China is the only other country that's been sending people to space, if there are similar limits. Yeah. Thanks. So, so the one sievert gets talked about uh, two reasons. Number one, it's, it's, it's the unit dose. Uh, so typically people, to give context for a radiation exposure, will say, here's the amount of risk for one sievert, just to give a, a, a unit uh, you know, for, for comparison purposes. So it's, you know, as, as it's the unit dose that we use in our, in our field, we'll say a 5% per one sievert. Um, it also turns out that that one sievert um, it, uh, has been employed in other space agencies as a career-limiting dose. Um, as I said, NASA does not do that, um, and the, the standards set by the other space agencies are their purview. And why they select a certain dose limit and an allowable risk um, is, you know, uh, up to their state standards versus what NASA is doing. But so you'll, that's two reasons. You, you you will find it in other agency standards, and you will find it uh, as just a a reference point for uh, comparing against exposure values. Did that answer your question? One moment, please. Ma'am, your line is open. Irene, was your question answered? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from Peter Spatz. Uh, I guess... Uh, at the risk of belaboring the point, I think this builds a little bit on, on Irene's question here. In reading the paper uh, in Science down toward the end, uh, there's a discussion of, of this, and the, the, um, uh, the authors give this uh, 30 to 60-year-old, and they give ranges, so that, I think, uh, uh, talks about the, um, you know, the, the applicability to the individual. But it also says that the dose limits at the 95 confidence levels are about one-third of those central values that they give for the 30 to 60 year old, uh, you know, in these different groups. So, does, uh, in, in looking at those one third numbers compared with some of these radiation uh, <clears throat> statistics back from RAD, it all, is is it correct? I mean, it, it looks like uh, just the one way um, galactic cosmic ray exposure based on the RAD measurements would violate. Uh, for some people, would violate NASA's criteria at the moment. Yeah, and that's correct. You've you've understood that the wording in the paper correctly. Thank you. Our next question is from Ken Kramer. Hi, thanks, Ken Kramer from Universe Today. Thanks for doing this. Um, I have a question. I'm not sure you answered this before, but can you tell us um, what is the projected based on the data that you have today? What would be the projected round trip uh, dose going going to Mars and and back? Uh, this is Kerry. Uh, we actually, uh, yeah, we may not have said that today. It, it's in the paper. Um, and uh, assuming the sort of fast, faster trajectory, um, MSL did not take the fastest possible trajectory just uh, because of the timing and uh, where the planets were when we launched. Uh, but the shortest trajectory with chemical. Uh, propulsion is 180 days each way, uh, and so we, we did consider that at 360 days in interplanetary space, and with our uh, 1.8 millisieverts per day, that works out to 660 millisieverts uh, for the interplanetary transit uh, part of the mission. Did you, did you make a projection for closer to like a 500-day mission? No. Um, you, you could take our 1.8 millisieverts per day and and multiply just, that by 500, and you would get 900 millisieverts. Okay, and and um, you haven't really discussed the surface data here, but how how would the surface data compare to the transit data? I mean, I don't know if you have an exact number, but if you could say roughly, would it be higher, lower, or equivalent? Thanks. 
I'll take that. Um, well, the the surface data we're getting ready to publish that uh, in, a, in a couple of months. We're submitting that data. That's sort of part two of of this two part uh, series. Um, but if you just look at first principles, the, the radiation in deep space comes from every direction. So four pi to radians <coughs> on the surface of a planet such as Mars, you're automatically blocking about half of that um, from from the surface. So you know, just to zero order, you would say it might be roughly a half. But the radiation environment is also modified by both the atmosphere as well as uh, the interaction of the radiation with uh, with the surface and the secondary particles that are created uh, from interactions with the surface. So we're working on that, and that will be published uh, hopefully soon. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Dirk Wagner. Radio HR Info, thank you for taking uh, my question. This may be for Eddie, I think. Um, I was looking at the graphic called Zeitlin 1, where you have these uh, five spikes in the data representing solar particle events. Um, would that be types of events where a human crew on the way to Mars would um, uh, would to have uh, seek uh, protection in a uh, solar storm shelter? And uh, if so, how long before uh, would you be able to warn them? Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Um, our concept of operations would, you know, would try to reduce the exposures throughout the mission. So these particular ones were not very large, and the total doses were not large. But you know, if you're on a transit mission and it's, uh, you know, we employ this ALARA principle, we want to try to reduce exposures if it's reasonable. So for a mission, uh, we're going to have onboard sensors. It's going to incre you know, show increases, uh, just like RAD did, and we'll have warning uh, from other satellites and forecasting tools that will, you know, the beginning of those spikes, we could easily deploy our shield and, and seek, uh, seek shelter. And, you know, depending on how long that event would be, we would use the, the onboard instruments to tell us, you know, what the rates are, and we would adjust the crew uh, timeline such that, you know, they're going to afford the maximum shield uh, effectiveness, you know, from from those events. So certainly if you're on the way to Mars, we're going to try to get those spikes down as low as possible because you know you're sitting on this galactic cosmic rays uh, ray that you're seeing every day. So certainly, our, you know, without giving you exact numerics, anything that's going to be elevated, we could certainly utilize a shield to reduce the impacts uh, if it's not – uh, you know, if they're not performing some very mission critical uh, steps that, that they can't be within a shelter. Fine, thanks. Our next question is from Al Stoller. Stoller, KVMR FM. Two questions, if I may. One is uh, what's the significance of being able to measure the dose both at the ISS and Curiosity? I think the significance lies in the fact that you know we have ongoing missions and we have uh, crew members that we're uh, we're following uh, throughout their lives for their uh, yeah, for their their health outcomes. We're, we're employing tools and risk uh, risk models to estimate um, their specific risk based on this instrument. And a lot of times the instruments differ in the analysis and the teams that are looking at the data. So we're eliminating and reducing any kind of differences between uh, our destination measurements, such as you know, this Mars measurement and our ISS measurement. So it's, we're going to make an equivalent measurement such that we, we uh, are, are dealing with the same tools to estimate the risks and, and eliminating any differences. And who is speaking, please? This is Eddie Simonis. Oh, okay. Uh, one other thing, could you compare the shielding on Apollo versus MSL? I think Kerry addressed that in the paper, if you would like to address that, Kerry. Uh, sure. Yeah, thanks, Eddie. Um, Apollo, uh, the Apollo uh, vehicle was, was uh, fairly lightly shielded. Um, uh, MSL was more shielded. Um, well, let me, let me just discuss it for a moment from RAD's perspective. RAD is mounted to the top deck of the Curiosity rover, and if you remember the uh, entry, descent, landing sequence that... Uh, that uh, went so spectacularly well at Mars. Um, there, there was a lot of other equipment involved. There was this descent vehicle, and there was a parachute, and there was an, an outer shell of the spacecraft. And all of that was above RAD, um, above the rover and above RAD.
rad during the cruise, and that was fairly heavy shielding. And below rad uh, was basically just the um, the spacecraft's heat shield. So rad was unevenly shielded. It it was lightly shielded in its lower field of view and heavily shielded in its upper field of view. So um, on average, uh, it's actually not so different than say average shielding on the space station, but uh, more heavily shielded on average than Apollo was. Thank you. Our next question is from Jason Ryan. Hi, uh, Jason Ryan with americaspace.com. I'm going to throw this question out there to anyone. i got to follow up afterwards. I'm going to kind of ask you to speculate here. Uh, given Curiosity's findings, could it be argued that a more incremental exploration plan, one that involves the moon, asteroids, you know, slow step-by-step -step, uh, program that would eventually lead to Mars, it's probably more sensible at this point than one that, like, I guess some like Mars First are kind of posing at this time. Hello, Jason. Jason, re repeat that. Uh, well, given the fi given Curiosity's findings, uh, I'm just curious: is a more incremental uh, exploration program, human exploration program? one that involves moon, uh, asteroids, Lagrange points, and allowing us to learn how to really make our way to Mars would be uh, more sensible than, uh, like, some of the initiatives that say, let's go to Mars, you know, let's avoid the moon, we've been there. Uh, would you argue that perhaps that might be a more incremental plan would probably be the best? Yeah, so this is Chris Moore. Uh, we're developing new capabilities in a stepwise fashion to explore ever deeper into space. So our, in the near term, we're sending Orion to cislunar space, and then our objectives are to go to near-Earth asteroids and then eventually to Mars and its moons in the 2030 uh, time frame. So we do see the value in testing out advanced technologies and operational concepts closer to home before we commit to longer, more risky missions. The well, follow-up I have for that is uh, Inspiration Mars uh, by Dennis Tito, I believe, is he um, has, uh, proposed a flyby of Mars around 2018. Uh, do these findings dampen, or you, could you see them hindering his plans in any way? Well, we will make the data from RAD available to him to help him inform his plans. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see, uh, I see that we've uh, I think taken all the questions from everyone who's queued up so far. I know there are a couple of reporters who had questions that wanted to do some follow-ups. I think we can get through those quickly, but we are drawing to the close of the hour, so if you could make them brief, let's just take three more fast ones, and uh, then we'll draw to a close. Thank you. The next question is from Kenneth Chang. Hi. Thanks for taking the second question. Um, my question was, how is the limit set at 3 percent? I mean, it seems like if you had a Mars mission ready to go today and you told the potential astronauts like, you'd be the first to Mars, but the trade-off is that you have a 3 percent excess cancer risk, I'm guessing that you have a huge line of people willing to go. Is this really a showstopper? I guess that's for Eddie. And that other risks, like a malfunction, would be much higher. Well, in this case, you know, using the words like showstopper or or not, you know, it's it's, it's difficult to say that. Uh, I can say that, uh, given this data and our models that are, you know confirm it, you know, we're currently would exceed our acceptable limits of three percent excess fatal cancer. You know, it, if we go forward and we're going to do longer duration missions that would uh, cause the crew's uh, risk to be higher. Um, the the, you know, the the ethics involved with allowing that to happen, and the mitigations that we take we would take uh, to protect the crew uh, is going to evolve before you know before you know we make those decisions. You know, I mean that's that's what um, our, our research uh, program is looking at, our technology development, and um, the. The panels that are evaluating the applicability of these standards going forward will be evaluating, comparing these risks with other mission risks and, and ensuring that we uh, provide uh, the crew the safest environment possible to conduct these missions. 
why three, not two or five? Yeah, I don't, I'm, um, I don't know if there's a, a simple answer to your question. Uh, you know, these, these have been established by um, regulatory bodies, the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements, which provides recommendations to us, um, have made these recommendations, and we're, and we're following them, and they're uh, within our standards currently. Thank you. So it's got a lot of more background uh, than, than we can answer quickly uh, in, a, in this telecon. Let's take the last two questions. Thank you. The next question is from Irene Klotz. Um, thanks. Regarding Ken's question, just to clarify, it's my understanding um, it, it's not really NASA's choice to waive a, a career radiation limit, it's, and it's not an astronaut's choice either. These are, these are standards that are set, and currently the space agency is obliged to follow them. Is that right? And then my question is... Um, that's true. I'm sorry, go ahead. That was very well put. Yes, that's true. Okay, thanks. And my question is, does anybody know what um, the radiation dosage for some of those uh, people who were went into the nuclear power plant in Japan and Fukushima and was working and maybe just for some context, what's considered a fatal dose of radiation in millisieverts or sieverts? Thanks. Yeah, so for the summary of... Uh, the doses incurred to the, the Japanese workers. I'd point you to the IAE, IAEA website. Um, they have a, a detailed summaries of the emergency workers and their exposures uh, that took place. But uh, certainly, there were uh, some were in excess of 100 millisieverts. As given, if you compare it to that chart um, that uh, Gary had provided. Um, that had a scale of those doses. Keep in mind, once again, those exposures to the Japanese were to gamma rays and beta particles, which um, the, uh, the biological effects of those are, are more well understood than the heavy ion component in the space radiation field. So even though we, we, we quantify them the same with the quality factor that uh, Carrie had mentioned and we try to equate them, the uncertainties and the risks are much larger for the space environment. So uh, when we produce our risk projections, that's why we have these factors of, of three uh, that the gentleman had asked about uh, that's referenced in the paper that cause us to uh, uh, a, a much larger range of uncertainties when we project risk. So just keep that in mind when you're trying to compare Earth-based you know, gamma ray exposures of the same quantities with the space-based quantities. And, and was, there, was there another part of your question? I think we're up, we're up to the last question now. Thank you. Our final question will come from Peter Spatz. Oh, thank you very much, and hopefully this will be the easiest of them all. Uh, and maybe this is for Chris. Uh, you mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned uh, the uh, mitigation approaches, and one of which was, um, uh, I don't know, suits or so, some sort of personal protection for astronauts within, uh, within a, uh, a spacecraft. Can you describe a little bit what that suit, you know, what it's made of or how, the, how that kind of works? Yeah, some of our initial concepts involved multi layers of polyethylene plastic. Um, so it's maybe an inch or two thick. Uh, I tried on one of those uh, garments once. It reminds me of uh, samurai armor. It looks <laughs> like a very heavy coat. Uh, it feels like a very heavy coat. So that's one concept. Um, there's other concepts to deploy. Uh, temporary um, walls or enclosures around the astronauts' uh, sleeping quarters. But ideally, we'd like to arrange the configuration of the habitat to um, provide radiation protection, as I mentioned, by surrounding the crew with, with uh, water, which contains a lot of hydrogen, and that's the most effective shielding material that we know of currently. Thank you. Okay, sounds like that's going to do it for today's media telecom. I'd like to thank the speakers for their time today. Uh, for more information about the findings in the Mars Science Laboratory mission, visit www.nasa.gov msl. For more information on NASA human spaceflight and exploration, visit nasa.gov exploration. Uh, there will be a replay available of this call at the following number. Uh, it's 203-369-3075. Again, it's 203-369-3075. Uh, thanks for joining us, and have a great day.
Thank you, everyone, for